So uh, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Graham Stevens here from Kativ. Um, I am an application engineer, and uh, I'm pleased to uh, introduce this installment of Kativ's Virtual Academy. And we're doing a short session on introduction to HFSS uh, mesh fusion, marrying the micro to the macro to solve the previously impossible and speed up your HFSS simulations. So uh, on our agenda today is we're going to be covering uh, mesh fusion uh, within HFSS, um, uh, the ANSYS software high frequency um, uh, simulator, and cover when does this um, apply, um, how and why is it, what, what does it do for you, what are the results, what are some of the benefits, and then we'll uh, jump into a demonstration of of how you set up uh, mesh fusion simulations and results. And then finally, a Q&A session at the end. So as I said, I'm a, uh, an application engineer focused on ANSYS products uh, here at Kativ. Uh, I've got 25 years of experience of product development, consulting, and simulation experience. Uh, and I'm the application engineer providing application support for ANSYS uh, high and low frequency electronic applications uh, here at Kativ for, for you, uh, our customers. So uh, mesh fusion and HFSS, what is it? Um, so uh, ANSYS, uh, in uh, doing research on uh, meshing and uh, finite element analysis simulation, uh, found a, a way to break a, an old FEM rule. And that rule sort of stated that essentially mesh elements that share a common face must also, must also share common mesh node points. So you can see in this right, uh, picture here, we have a mesh of, of two different objects that are coming together, and each of these node points uh, has a corresponding node point, you know, directly opposite to it that it marries to. Uh, and mesh fusion um, is a breakthrough whereby uh, mesh elements sharing a common face do not need to share common mesh node points. So we can take different types of meshes uh, and smoosh them together and make it seamless and get fully coupled fields across those region interfaces. Uh, and that allows us to do a number of things, which we'll jump into. Um, but in particular, it, it, it allows you to, to use uh, different mesh elements and still get HFSS um, gold standard accuracy across those region interfaces. And so what this allows is you to mix different meshes um, in your designs. And uh, what that allows as well is to, to use the, the most appropriate meshing technology for a particular object or structure uh, and thereby uh, reduce perhaps the total number of node points. So if I have a curvilinear surface, and I'm trying to use the classic meshing technology uh, with enough note with enough um, uh, node points, you know, additional node points. I can definitely model that curved surface. But if I use the tau mesher where it it puts the node points, you know, directly on the curve curvilinear surface, and it's and it's you know basically curvilinear meshing, uh, then I get fewer node points for that curvilinear object. Uh, and similarly, there's a, a fee uh, plus uh, meshing technology, which is new, uh, that's designed for 2D layered structures uh, and then, and then uh, with or without bond wires. Uh, and that technology as well uh, allows much faster meshing for those types of structures um, and fewer node points uh, to model it. So this allows us to, to use the appropriate meshing type for the appropriate, for the appropriate objects and mix and match these in a in a in the same FEM simulation with HFSS. And so uh, mesh fusion really shines uh, with uh, these uh, different uh, uh, applications, essentially. So the first one that it shines for is with large repeating element assemblies, uh, such as phased array antennas um, or phased antenna arrays. And the, um, uh, that particular 
use of it. It's, it's using 3D components within your array. Uh, and we're not going to cover that uh, today. There's a, a course uh, on that specifically uh, that I'll refer to at the very end. So we'll, we'll get you guidance for that if, if that's the type of assembly you're trying to do. Um, and, but today we're going to focus more on complex assemblies involving micro and macro areas in the same design. Uh, so HFSS mesh fusion is, is used in these uh, large repeating element assemblies, uh, but the setup is slightly different, the workflow is different, um, and, uh, and we're not going to cover that this, this morning, um, but I will give you a pointer on, on where to go for that in terms of, of getting to that, um, uh, to that workflow if need be. Uh, so what we are going to focus on, though, is these complex assemblies where we might have um, a two-dimensional structure, a PCB board that's using the fee meshing um, uh, to get very fast meshing of the 2D structure, combine it with small chips or um, uh, that have very fine mesh at, at the very micro scale on the board, and then combine it with connectors. It's much larger in different uh, shapes and sizes, whether they're uh, curved surfaces or whether they're more boxy and classic mesh is more appropriate. Uh, and you can, this mesh fusion allows you to, to do all of them together in one, one simulation. Um, and with that, uh, there are some limitations associated with mesh fusion. So mesh fusion uh, is associated with FEM only. So it is uh, not compatible with hybrid or array options. However, there is a 3D component array workflow that I mentioned before that uses mesh fusion underlying. Um, and, uh, and that's a workflow we're not going to cover today, um, but it is, it is FEM only. And so with that restriction, uh, mesh fusion does not work with electrically large analyses where you have Phoebe regions or you have IE or SBR, SBR plus regions. Um, uh, uh, when you get to you know, more than 10 wavelengths and you're looking at SBR plus, um, uh, mesh fusion uh, is no longer used, you would, you would then you know, jump to an SBR plus model. Um, so that's uh, some of the limitations associated with mesh fusion. Um, and then some of the benefits are that uh, previously when you had analyses where you have um, a very tiny object uh, on top of a, a very large object, uh, it was impossible to, um, you know, something at the millimeter scale versus the meter scale. It might have been much more impossible or computationally intractable to, to mesh and model all of that together. Uh, and now with mesh fusion, you can. So you can you can uh, mix and match micro designs, macro designs, uh, and mesh fusion makes these designs computationally tractable where they weren't before. Uh, so that's the primary benefit of uh, HFSS mesh fusion. Uh, and then um, you can also sometimes get uh, um, reduction in total meshing time. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, the, the phi mesher, phi plus mesher is, is faster for 2D layer structures. Uh, and sometimes when you're using the most appropriate mesh for your objects, you can reduce the total node points. Uh, needed to obtain high accuracy, and that then can reduce the simulation times for solving and sweeps and so forth. And the other advantage of, of using mesh fusion is that each of the 3D components that you um, uh, designate uh, can then be meshed in parallel. So you can, you can get a, a reduction in meshing times, uh, especially if you have a high number of parametric iterations or more complex designs and, and obviously using HPC to reduce those uh, computation times for the mesh. Um, so all of this can add up to um, uh, faster simulations, uh, but it also, it, it, as, as most things, it depends. So it depends on um, uh, your actual simulation, it depends on the components, um, uh, it's not guaranteed that mesh fusion will give you a speed up, but typically this is what we're sort of seeing in terms of where you do get a speed up is, is when you have high meshing times, uh, lots of uh, parametric iterations or more complex designs, uh, you'll start to see more of the benefits. And uh, so now I wanted to just sort of show some examples of where you would use mesh fusions. 
Um, so the first uh, example I wanted to show here is uh, Mesh Fusion was first implemented as a, as a 3D component array, uh, which is that second workflow I was uh, talking about earlier, uh, where we have a repeatable array. And each of these individual cells uh, of the array, I might model specifically the corners and the side and a center. And with those three separate components, um, uh, that I, I mesh those three separate components and then put them in an array and uh, saves a huge amount of time because the three components themselves can be meshed um, uh, in parallel, uh, saving time. And then I only have to I only have to model specifically those three components to then get results for this entire array. Uh, and so you, you can get a, a very large savings in time uh, using these repeating elements in that particular workflow. Um, and a, a second example here uh, of mesh fusion is uh, where we have a, a, an entire system here with a vehicle, a test horn antenna, the pedestal, a chamber including absorbing foam, uh, and we have lots of different uh, scales. So we have uh, the horn itself and its feed system, and then we have the absorbing foam, and then we have the car and all in the test chamber. And so all of these are at, at sort of different scales and it allows you to combine meshing uh, of the you know, most appropriate meshing for the car is very different from uh, the foam and allows you to combine and, and, uh, and get some speed ups here because the meshing time is in this particular design is, is pretty long and therefore uh, mesh fusion will allow you to allow you to go faster here. Um, and we have different meshing. So we're using tau for the antenna, uh, tau flex for the chamber and fee mesh for the TV, for instance, here. And then uh, another example is just a mesh fusion um, uh, drone. So we have uh, within the drone, we have a PCB board, we have a package um, in, in the PCB board, and then we have the drone itself with all its different components uh, and, and assemblies. Uh, and because uh, uh, we're using, you know, say that the fee mesher for the PCB and the package, uh, and then combining that with the drone, again, we can, we can uh, mesh all of these in parallel and get some time savings uh, associated with, with modeling the drone. And uh, an even more complex example here is a five gigahertz RFIC, uh, where we have uh, individual coils you can sort of see on the circuit board, uh, different connectors, uh, you know, lots of different components. And again, with, with using a high level here, in this case of, of HPC, where we have you know, 700 cores plus and lots of memory, uh, we can again uh, save a lot of time for these more complex designs. Um, and this is just another example here uh, with you know, the kind of time savings we can get um, uh, associated with this. So uh, the initial meshing, you get um, uh, your highest level of time savings and then the adaptive meshing some, and then finally uh, some time savings as well during the sweeps because of the reduced number um, amount of mesh that's needed. Uh, we can see the, the number of mesh elements for the global mesh here was 460,000 tets. Uh, uh, sorry, 4.6 million tets versus 2.8 million tets uh, in terms of mesh fusion. And that reduction in the total number of elements uh, leads you to savings on the, on the sweep as well. So, uh, so how do we set up mesh fusion and how do we, uh, how do, we do this? So uh, there's a couple of steps to do it. Uh, I, the, the first one is if you happen to have uh, 2021 R1, uh, Mesh Fusion at, for that particular version was implemented as a beta feature. Uh, so to enable it, you would need to go into the options, general options, and then this beta options box. And then at the very bottom of that list uh, is HFSS FEM mesh assembly. And if you check that and press OK, um, you'll uh, set up HFSS for, for bringing mesh fusion uh, in, into um, using it. Uh, past uh, 2021 R1 in R2 and beyond, um, mesh fusion was, was included as standard. Uh, and so uh, you, you definitely want to make sure that you're sort of up to date in terms of which version you're using. This is a, a pretty new feature. Uh, so from 2021 R2 and beyond, um, it's, it's standard. And then uh, you um, 
uh, divide the areas that you want to uh, to simulate into 3D components. So we separate different areas of the design where you want to change the mesh. Uh, so in this particular instance, we have um, an inductor here, which is which has been defined as a 3D component that's getting uh, put onto a board. Uh, and it's very simple for that uh, inductor and 3D component. Uh, you essentially right click um, into the, the uh, properties of that component. And there's a do mesh assembly checkbox for that component. And you check that, and that uh, turns on Mesh Fusion. Um, uh, and uh, similarly, there's a, a, uh, a an easier way, not an easier way, but a different way to um, uh, to do Mesh Fusion is in the project tree in the 3D component area. If you right click on that and do this Set Components for Mesh Confusion Mesh Fusion option, uh, it'll bring up this. Uh, mesh fusion settings box. Uh, so it'll, for each of the components, there'll be an enable checkbox for uh, that particular box. Uh, you can change meshing types. Uh, you can um, uh, designate which components are using mesh fusion or not. Uh, and then in some cases, you can um, uh, adjust the mesh envelope padding as well. Uh, and so there are a couple of options here in terms of meshing methods and overrides and, and mesh padding. Uh, so, but this is this is sort of your uh, area to um, do all the mesh fusion settings essentially is, is on the 3D component side. Um, so the mesh envelope uh, defines a volume around the component for local mesh uh, and it defaults to a 0% uh, padded bounding box. So essentially if we just Take a look at your 3D component and put the smallest box that'll fit around it uh, all together. Uh, and that bounding box is, is uh, set as the default, but you can change the padding for that mesh envelope. And you can also, uh, and we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, if you want a different envelope than that kind of smallest box, um, you can designate that as well. Um, so we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. Um, so some of the setup associated with Mesh Fusion is I have to create these 3D components. I have to take my, my total design and break them apart into sections called 3D components um, and, and um, to set your mesh regions to tell HFSS, yeah, this, is, this, this area of the design is a different meshing technology or, or um, area of focus uh, than another. So the designs are created as an assembly of 3D components. Uh, and in addition to creating 3D components, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, uh, and modeling them separately, uh, and then having a library of 3D components that you then pull into your designs, uh, which you can certainly do, you can also start with an existing design that has a lot of geometry in it, select in the project tree, okay, I'm going to select this antenna uh, down below here, and I want to create a 3D component, uh, and um, you you simply do this option here uh, where you do a quick create where you select the the geometry uh, and right click in the model window and just do replace with 3D component. You can sort of see this uh, option here uh, and then that part of the model will get broken out into a 3D component uh, and you can continue onward. Um, and um, and as we were talking before, you can just edit the definition of that uh, component um, uh, to designate the meshing and, and, and look at um, the, the mesh fusion settings associated with that component. Um, so these are this only applies for unencrypted 3D components um, that you can edit them after creation. Uh, if it's encrypted, uh, you, that would not apply. You can't edit those in terms of editing the definition. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so you can this design for editing for component definition. You can you can you know jump to you know, once you, once you've broken out a three D component, you can then separate it into its own analysis, run those analyses, and a, and a three D component is really useful because you can pull together, pull in not only the geometry of a particular object, but you can pull in boundary conditions, you can pull in excitations, you can pull in other meshing conditions, uh, um, other aspects of the design uh, also can get associated with that 
with the geometry as part of that 3D component. Um, and, then, uh, and then, as I was mentioned before, you can also designate, uh, if, you, if you want something different than a simple bounding box for the mesh region, um, which is the default, uh, you can create a customized mesh region. So essentially what this typically is, is you would um, uh, create a, a dummy object uh, made of vacuum, whether it's a box or some other shape, but this one looks like it's sort of a little bit pyramidal instead of a, a, the actual box. Uh, and then select uh, on that object uh, and do this assign mesh region um, option when you right click on it. Uh, and that will, uh, create a customized mesh region for that object um, uh, if, if desired. And so, as I said, if, if you'd like, uh, you can do that. You can also, uh, if you don't have a mesh region object, it will simply take the bounding box uh, by default uh, and then save that as part of your 3D component definition. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is mesh fusion is available in HFSS uh, 3D layout as well. Um, with you know all the things that we were just talking about within HFSS apply um, uh, to HFSS 3D layout. Uh, so please be aware of that and take advantage of that as well. Um, so with that, I wanted to uh, shift to uh, the demonstration part of this just to give you a sense of uh, how these, uh, how easy it is to do this and, and some examples of, of HFSS mesh fusion. Um, so the first one I wanted to um, uh, show is um, uh, this is uh, this inductor here with uh, that's been been placed uh, with two ports um, uh, and a, um, a strip. Uh, and if we look at it, we have the inductor as a 3D component uh, and to uh, change to to include this design in mesh fusion we we take this we go to 3d components we click on this set components for mesh fusion here uh, and then make sure that the inductor enable box is checked and then that is is now that's the setup for mesh fusion for that component um, and press ok and it's it's all set and similarly we can go to the properties of this 3d component and if you look at the um, uh, something called the mesh operations tab at the very bottom here, there's, there's a, a number of tabs. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the 3D components are really useful because I can associate parameters with the component. Uh, I can associate different materials with the component, uh, boundary conditions, excitations, regions, circuit elements. All of these are associated with, a, with the 3D component as, 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 a, as a total thing. Uh, and then finally, this in the mesh operations um, uh, um, tab, there's this do mesh assembly checkbox here, which allows you to turn mesh fusion on and off for this particular component. Um, and that's it. So uh, you have to remember, of course, that all of the standard uh, conditions and ways that you would run an FEM model in terms of you know, airspace for radiating surfaces and, and, um, uh, and so forth are followed. Um, we're still, this is you know, very much an, an FEM uh, simulation uh, and we can uh, run the simulation and, and get the, uh, the S parameters for the model um, you know, as usual uh, and the mesh plots. Uh, well, sorry, this one here's, uh, there we go. So this is, uh, the mesh plots for these designs. Uh, and you can see how, uh, at the boundary, um, even though it's non-conformal, um, uh, uh um, mesh fusion is able to, to marry these meshes together. Um, and uh, yeah. And then similarly, we've got a mesh plot for this 
version as well. So um, uh, this is uh, how you set up and run those simulations. Um, and then for some of the other uh, uh, possibilities I wanted to alert you to, um, uh, as I mentioned before, there is this alternate uh, hybrid uh, network uh, where we have um, uh, look at, um, an antenna array where we have repeating elements and each of the elements are, um, uh, are a, a 3D component, a model is a 3D component, uh, and that uses mesh fusion underlying, kind of underlying the, the, the um, uh, HFSS uses mesh fusion to enable that, uh, but the workflow is slightly different. You do have a solution type here of hybrid and array, and you're using an array. Um, and so there's a different workflow uh, and, and we're simply modeling each of modeling the corner or the sides or an empty and then maybe the radome. So we're really only modeling five components here and then they're associated with an array, um, which we can look at the unit cells and sort of designate what does the array look like. Uh, but this is a separate workflow um, than what we were just describing before. And then uh, the other design I wanted to show you in terms of just complications uh, of the design uh, is uh, this sort of uh, circuit board where we have tons of different components. Uh, uh, we have connectors, capacitors, USB connectors, HDMI, ribbon cables, um, resistors, uh, chips, and all of these uh, can be you know, defined as components and you know, placed on the board. Um, uh, you know, whether you, you start in HFS 3D layout uh, and start placing these there, whether you're um, then adding a, a, a more mechanical part of the connectors uh, onto the board. Um, uh, and then once we have them all uh, as 3D components and we have, you know, a lot more components now here and a lot more complex design, uh, we do this, the same procedure in terms of right clicking on 3D components here um, and getting to the screen to enable uh, uh, 3D components for, for all of these, I'm sorry, enabling mesh fusion for this design um, and, and then solve it. So um, HFSS uh, mesh fusion uh, expands the available designs that can be simulated, uh, delivers you know, the same HFSS rigor, accuracy, fidelity that you're used to with HFSS uh, and allows you to do system simulations and tenants on platforms, ICs on packages, uh, ICs on packages on PCBs, complex systems for EMI, EMC, and solve the previously unsolvable. You can sort of see some of these uh, uh, you know, pretty complex designs uh, that it enables. And then uh, I wanted to uh, alert you to some of the additional resources. Um, uh, we have um, uh, ANSYS Learning Hub. You, there are a few mesh fusion courses on the ANSYS Learning Hub that are useful. Uh, if you're interested in the 3D component array uh, analysis um, and using arrays uh, with 3D components, there's a, a, an M3.1 uh, module or workshop uh, called 3D Component Array Analysis that would be useful. And then there's a, a uh, mesh fusion course on simulating complex electromagnetic systems with HFSS mesh fusion uh, for further information. Uh, as, as always with Kativ, uh, we have a support line here by email, support at kativ.com or an 8, uh, 866 number uh, to give us a call. Uh, if you've got issues with um, uh, that you're struggling with in terms of setup or um, you know, any issues with the software. Uh, and um, uh, Kativ is also uh, offering simulation services. So we also, in addition to providing technical support, uh, can do simulations in the mechanical fluid and electronics realms um, from stress analysis, contract heat transfer and flow, discrete phase flows, uh, and then HFS analyses or Maxwell or signal integrity, Q3D. Um, uh, if you have uh, electromagnetic problems, fluid problems or mechanical uh, issues that you're looking to outsource, um, uh, please keep us in mind. 
Uh, and then I wanted to just uh, share some upcoming events. Uh, so uh, there's a top strategic business trends for manufacturing industries uh, with uh, Kativ, Tacton, and McKinsey uh, coming up on February 23rd. Uh, and for that, please register at tacton.com. Uh, there is a digital manufacturing series, the digital key to opening the box uh, with business, business leaders on March 9th uh, at 10 a.m. Uh, please again register for that at kativ.com. And then uh, next week's uh, Kativ's virtual academy is Vault for Make. And again, please register at kativ.com for that session as well. Uh, and with that, uh, that's my conclusion. Thank you so much for your time and attention, and I hope this has been helpful.